O Lord, uphold thou me, that I may uplift thee. Amen. Christianity in our Western culture seems so comfortable, so tame, so safe. I mean, you and I can gather together as Christians on a Sunday morning, say our prayers, take part in the Eucharist, and go home again without having to worry about anything more than where am I going to park this morning? Will I know any of the hymns? Will the sermon have anything to offer me today? For many people, there is absolutely no risk in being a Christian, no challenge. Following Christ requires little sacrifice. It's like the faith has been boiled down and homogenized, sanitized, sterilized. And worst of all, from my point of view, Christianity has been made quite reasonable. But that isn't how it was when those first followers of Jesus began to gather together after the resurrection. They were anything but status quo, and their faith was anything but reasonable. To the average Roman citizen, these people that we read about in our lesson from Acts this morning, they were considered lunatics, out of their mind fringe fanatics, devoted to some dead prophet. Their leader, Jesus, had been put to death as a political troublemaker, nipped in the bud after only three years of ministry. From the Roman point of view, he'd, he'd never amassed an army. He didn't even have that many followers. He left his disciples no fortune, no money by which they could carry on. In fact, these followers of Jesus seemed to attract the rabble and the riffraff. Sure, a few wealthy people could be counted amongst their numbers, but they were just bizarre enough to believe that they could actually share everything in common. How naive, how ridiculous they seemed to everyone around them. They were a bunch of Jews and Gentiles, Greeks, slaves and free folks, poor people who believed that this man called Christus had risen from the dead. But and here is the fact that makes all the difference. They believed it totally and completely and they lived with an incredible sense of joy and purpose. Sometimes I wonder if we really get it these days. We are so far removed from the folks we read about in Acts, and we really have to adjust our thinking to understand what it meant in the first 250 years to call yourself a Christian. It is difficult for us to get our heads around what the Roman world thought about Christians because there are a few surviving accounts written by those on the outside looking in. Lucian of Samosota, a writer of the second century, a Roman, gives us a little glimpse of how strange Christians appeared to those in the status quo. Christians, he said, display an absurd generosity and they have a sacrificial concern for other people they don't even know. The poor wretches have convinced themselves, he goes on to say, that they are going to be immortal. They despise death and they even willingly give themselves into custody. 
Tacitus, also writing in the second century, records how Nero blamed Christians for the burning of Rome for the great fire. He writes, Nero fastened the guilt and afflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Pliny, a Roman governor, wrote to the Emperor Trajan around the year 112 that Christians were nothing more than a perverse and extravagant superstition. Listen to that language. Absurd, poor wretches, abominations, hated class, superstition. To the Romans, if you were a follower of Christ, then you were at best someone to be pitied. At worst, you were someone worthy of torture and death. But those believers we read about this morning in Acts, they didn't care what the world thought about them. They had been touched, moved, set on fire by the power of the empty tomb by the truth and the life-giving joy of the resurrection. And they lived with such joy and such, uh, such passion and such purpose. They were willing to love so openly with that absurd generosity that they were willing to risk their very lives to proclaim the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who has faith in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That sort of passion, that sort of spirit, that should be ours too, yours and mine. It should fill this place. It should fill our lives from morning until night. Peter Marty tells a wonderful story about St. Anthony's Catholic Church in San Francisco. For years, St. Anthony's served meals to people in need, to the homeless and to the poor. Over the doorway to the dining room in the church, there was posted a sign bearing the inscription, Caritate Dei. One day, a young man released from jail entered through that doorway and sat down and was served a meal. A woman, a volunteer in the church, was busy cleaning the table next to his. When do we get down on our knees and do chores? He asked the lady. You don't, she said. Then, then when do we get preached to? He asked her. No sermon, she replied. Well, then how about the lecture on how I should live my life differently? When is that coming? Not here, she said. The man was suspicious. Then what's the gimmick? What's the catch? The woman pointed to the inscription over the door. He squinted at the sign, Caritate Dei. What does it mean, he asked. Out of love for God, she said with a smile, and then moved on to wash another table. Out of love for God. The power and the presence of the resurrected Christ brings about this kind of generosity where we just give to give, where we love to love with no strings attached, all because Christ is risen. This is the crazy nature of our faith that makes no sense to so many. And while it may feel tame to us on any given Sunday morning, it is anything but tame. The power of the resurrection is what made Martin Luther King crazy enough to have a dream and to die for it. The power of the resurrection is what made Mother Teresa crazy enough to think that her work in the slums of Calcutta could make any difference. 
The power of the resurrection is what made Desmond Tutu crazy enough to believe that a black South African could change one of the most repressive governments of all time. My friends, I wonder what might we do, caritate dei, out of love for God? Where is our joy, our passion, our purpose? So many in our country today are like sheep without a shepherd. There is great need out there, both spiritually and physically. Are we making a difference? Since the earliest days of the Christian faith, the followers of Jesus have proclaimed and strived to exemplify certain virtues. Faith, hope, love, wisdom, justice, courage, humility, integrity, respect. Many of these same virtues are principles that must undergird our democracy if we're going to survive as a nation. Now more than ever, we need people willing to extol these virtues, people willing to teach these virtues, people willing, because of the resurrected Christ, to exemplify these virtues. In this day and age when political partisanship has increased to such an extent that it is almost considered virtuous to hate the other side, we need something more than our political ideology. We need glad and generous hearts. We need the same kind of generosity of spirit that was dedicated and demonstrated by those earliest Christians. David Brooks, when he was here in February, lamented that there is a growing belief in our country that the world is so dangerous that we can't afford to be gentle and we can't afford to be good. But the radical good news of our faith says exactly the opposite. Because of the resurrection, the only thing that really matters is our struggle for goodness and gentleness and love. My brothers and sisters, I could wish nothing more for any of us than that you and I could be just a little bit like those crazy Christians, crazy with love and crazy with hope and crazy with joy. The world needs us now more than ever. The world needs the good news of the resurrected Christ. The world needs the good shepherd. The truth is when you put it into action, there is nothing easy or comfortable about being a Christian. There is nothing easy about following Jesus. But in the end, my heart tells me it is indeed the way and the truth and the life. Amen.